Okay. Manish, you started recording. I don't have to do it. I, I just saw it said that uh, someone has started recording. Is that correct? Okay. So let's get started here. <clears throat> this is the second official lecture. We're going to start today. Um, with the statistics end rather than the computer end. And the goal of this week and the next week is to start understanding what it means to analyze a data set. So, quick review. Uh, last week at the very end, we were discussing certain numbers that uh, describe a data set. We had the mean, the median, the standard deviation, and the variance. And in case you're not familiar, remember the mean is the arithmetic average. The mean is, is the data point that divides the data in half. The standard deviation tells you, on average, how much your data will differ from the mean. So it's a measure of how, how dispersed your data is. And the variance is uh, the square of the standard deviation. So in algebra terms, variance would seem more reasonable, but standard deviation is used most of the time. In particular, standard deviation has the same units as uh, your original data. And one thing we didn't mention, but another very important thing, is correlation. So correlation tells you something about how whether two data sets are related, and if so, how they are related. Um, the important thing to keep in mind, I just can't emphasize this enough, is correlation measures the linear relationship between the two data sets. So a correlation of plus one means you have a perfect correlation between the two data sets. They move linearly in exactly the same direction. A correlation of minus one also means they're perfectly correlated, but they're moving in opposite directions. A correlation of zero means that there is no linear relationship between the data sets. However, and again, I cannot emphasize this enough, that doesn't mean there is no relationship between the two data sets. It just means it's not a linear relationship. Oh, I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, and if you want to measure correlation in R, this is very simple. There's a function core and it works for vectors too. So I'm going to create a few vectors. So x is just the numbers 1 through 100. x1 is 2x plus 3. So that is I've taken the numbers 1 through 100, multiplied them all by 2 and added 3. x2 is the same one as x1, but I've added some noise. Well, more on our norms soon. x3 is the cosine of the data set, and x4 is the negative of x2. So remember this is this uh, 2 times x plus 1 with some noise and now I'm taking negative. So if I run this and then I, okay, so and then big X is C bind x, x1, x2 up through x4. Remember that C bind uh, says create a, a matrix uh, where the columns are, the, are just x, x1 through x4. And then I ask for the correlation of this so it's going to give me a matrix. So a cross will give you the correlations of x with itself, x1, x2, x3, and x4. And similarly, if I look down, this is the correlation of x2 with respectively x, x1, x2. So uh, just one thing to notice off the top of that, notice it's symmetric because the correlation of x with x4 is the same thing as the correlation of x with x4. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. So what is the correlation of x with everything? Of course, it's 100% correlated with itself. It's also 100% as a correlation of 1 with 2x plus 3 because there is a perfect linear relationship with them. All I did was I made x1 to be a linear combination of x. So, of course, x and x1 are perfectly correlated. x2 is I added noise. So notice that the correlation is essentially 1. Um, x3 is the cosine of x. Notice the correlation is, is essentially 0. This, um, this is, means it's a correlation of 0.01. It's essentially 0. So there is no correlation between x and the cosine of x. However, there's a very strong relationship 
and it's absolutely deterministic. Correlation will not pick this up. And then x4 is a negative, and notice again, it's essential. It's a, it's the same number, but now with a minus sign, because I've just changed x2 to go down, x4 to go down where x2 goes up. All right. Okay, so as I said, notice the symmetry. And the other thing I want to say is there is a nice geometric interpretation of a correlation. If I have two vectors, two data sets, x and y, okay, each of which has n pieces of data, we can view x and y as vectors in Rn. Each, each data point, each data set is given by the n coordinates of it. Then the correlation of xy is the cosine of the angle between x and y, and the cosine of a zero angle is 1. Now, there's mathematically, this is called Schwarz's formula, but the basic idea is when you, if you want to see how well two data sets are correlated, what it's saying is you're going to take them and consider them as vectors in Rn, and then the angle between them is going to be the correlation. So if they exactly match up, you're going to get a correlation of a 1, because there's, there's going to be zero angle. Now, the cosine of 180 degrees, surprisingly, is minus 1. So if you x is the opposite of y, so they're just the same vector in opposite directions, then you're going to see the correlation be minus 1. So this is why I say it's just a manifestation of um, that. All right, and now it's time to uh, briefly go over this. Let's see. Why won't it let me expand polls? There we go, okay. Let me launch this first one. Polls open. Okay, so this is a true false poll. Uh, which of the following is true? The median is always greater than the median. The median is always greater than mean. There is no ordering relationship. It depends on the data. All right. If you think you know what the answer is, um, I'm going to give you a hint, you're probably right. Most people are getting this one correct. Okay, just another 10 seconds. Okay, the correct answer is there is no ordering relationship. It depends upon the data. The mean is the average, and the median is the number that's in the middle. So depending on how great the wings are, the mean or the median can be greater. So let me give you um, a good example of this. In the United States, and I assume most of the world, there are a few people who are really, really richer than everyone else. You know, they, they, we've heard this talk about the 1%, but you're probably talking about not the 1%, but the 0.1% or the 0.001%. But when you have a few people that have really large incomes, right, that's going to drive up the mean. The median is going to stay relatively unchanged because there's millions and millions of people. And if 10 people make $10 billion a year, that doesn't affect the median. So typically what you have is, is a situation where the mean income of a country is much higher than the median income. Uh, the median income, uh, and this also, you know, and this also um, bears into the fact that, uh, you know, as we said, the median is in different outliers. You know, really large or really small numbers don't affect uh, what the median is because essentially every piece of data has an equal vote, whereas the mean, very large or very small values, in essence, vote more. So just for the record, of the people who took it, 83% said there is no ordering relationship. 
8% said the median is always greater. 8% said the mean is always greater. Okay, so I'm going to dock pain. Okay, let's, uh, oh, I think I want to give another poll. Okay, so one more poll. I'm asking, what's the relationship between the mean and standard deviation in terms of the sign? Are they both always positive? Are they both always negative? The mean is always greater than zero, but the standard de deviation can be um, positive or negative, or the mean can be anything it wants, but the standard deviation is always positive. Okay, keep in mind, the mean is just the average, and the standard deviation tells you how far away you are from the average. It's a horse race. We have, um, it's, well, now um, Aston 4 is pulling away a bit. All right, just another few seconds and I'll close the poll. Okay, the answer is the mean is arbitrary, but the standard deviation is always positive. The mean is the average value of your data set. Data could be anything. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be some positive, it can be some negative. The standard deviation is positive always by the formula, which says it's a square root, but more importantly, it tells you how far on average your data is from the mean. It wouldn't make sense to say, you know, I, I'm looking at incomes and the standard deviation is minus $3,000, mean income is 50000 What would it mean to be minus $3,000 away? $3,000 away is the only thing that makes sense. So 64% got it this right. 29% said the mean is always greater than zero, but standard deviation is arbitrary. And 7% said the mean and standard deviation are always positive. So I'm going to give thumbs up to the class on this one. Okay. So going back here, we've discussed mean and um, standard deviation, and we've discussed correlation. We want to start talking about distributions, and in particular, the normal distribution. The normal distribution is the most important um, distribution of data that is around and is likely to ever be around. Um, the reason for this is really twofold. Firstly, um, empirically, lots of data sets are normally distributed. Usually data sets that have to do with events that are you know, not involving human beings are normally distributed. Usually data sets that involve human beings look mostly like normal data sets, except they tend to be far more extreme events than the normal distribution will, uh, will claim should exist. So lots of time data looks normal, but the big exception is lots of time data have fat tails, which means that there's a more unusual events than a normal distribution uh, can uh, account for. The other reason why normal distributions are so nice is because you can calculate them. And one of the uh, important facts about the normal distribution is it's characterized by its mean and its standard deviation. That is, if you give a normal distribution and you say what its mean is and what its standard deviation is, you uniquely characterize it. This is very unusual. Most distributions don't have this property. But what this means is you can calculate with it much more easily. So I think I've said a lot of this. The only thing I want to, I guess that's, well, starting with the third bullet point, it's a lot of times you'll see something like this. That means a normal distribution with mean equal mu and sigma equal the standard deviation. And, um, oops, I, uh, 
right. I'm going to ask uh, for questions in just a second. Um, All right, so, all right, so another property of the normal distribution is that, as I said, you know, you have this fat tails exception, but 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% is within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about this, but before I do, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. All right, so I want to, the title of this lecture is Statistical Analysis. So what does this mean? A lot of times, almost inevitably, you don't have all the data. You're trying to estimate something, and frequently you're trying to estimate the mean. You may be trying to estimate the standard deviation, but usually you're trying to estimate the average or some sort of average of your data set, but you can't get your hands on all the data. Now, if you're taking polls for elections or something, this is clear. Um, and, you know, in, in real world data sets in every field from if you're interested in weather, if you're interested in economics. Okay, I do have one question. Uh, All right, so let me uh, get to that question in a second. Uh, so you're interested in estimating your data. And if you have the belief that your data comes from a normal distribution or something very similar, if you, if you have an estimate, using facts like this allows you to have some certainty of exactly how close your date, your estimate is to the real unknown value. Uh, so I'm asked, before normal distribution, please tell us about discrete versus continuous variables. Okay, so in this class, we're dealing with real data sets. Our data sets are always going to be uh, discrete, which is to say finite. So discrete means finite, really. It, it, it's a little bit of a clutch, but that's good enough for government work in this thing. Now, normal distribution is continuous, but in real life, one never sees an infinite amount of data. One, one uses the um, continuous distributions as approximations of the finite distributions that we see. In other words, you, you would say that theoretically, our data comes from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, but in fact, we can only see a finite piece of it. And we can also approximate our continuous distribution that's supposedly normal by taking samples and getting, say, a sample of 1,000 or 500 or whatever number you want um, draws from what you believe to be a normal distribution of mean zero and standard deviation one. Uh, so, traditionally in statistics, what you do is you say, we're going to assume our data comes from this continuous distribution and we are sampling from a population that's actually infinite. In practice, in modern statistics, that's less necessary because you're, there's less of an emphasis on understanding or thinking of your data set as a normal distribution. Um, so. Again, in, in, in the real world, there's lots of times when you're going to see a data set that looks approximately normal and you're going to use the normal properties. Now, if, if your distribution was infinite and you would have an exact equality, since you're doing statistics and you're interested in average values, frequently just having a good enough approximation is really just what you want. I hope that answers the question. So, Okay, and now I'm asked as a follow-up question, should we consider the observations from normal distribution as independent, or is it not related with the dependency? Okay, so this is getting to something I, I was going to discuss later, but maybe it's a good point to follow up. When you sample a data set, 
you have to make sure. Uh, so what does it mean to sample a data set? For example, suppose I said that 80% um, of the people are in the United States are Democratic. And you would say, well, that doesn't seem likely. After all, it's certainly not true that 80% of all politicians elected are Democrats. And you might say, well, where'd you take the poll? I said, well, I asked people in Chicago where I live whether they voted uh, Democrat or Republican. Chicago happens to be overwhelmingly Democratic. So if I sample only within Chicago, I've not sampled in the United States. So when you sample, almost always, the assumption is is that the sampling was random, that there's no hidden ordering, ordering to how you took the sample. Almost everything we, we're going to talk about takes place under the assumption that our samples are independent. So whether you're talking about normal distributions or any other kind of distributions, designing, understanding, or believing that the sample you have is coming from an independent draw of the data is very important. Now, if you're designing experiments, this is a very important issue. In other words, if you want to say, I believe that cigarette smoking causes cancer, or I believe that this drug will cure cancer, you have to go to very strong lengths to ensure that your sampling is, in fact, independent, or in other words, that you have some sort of uniform distribution of your data. In most practical statistics, with the exception of these very special studies in medicine, this is not what you have. What you have is a data set. You have what your customers bought. You have what the weather's been for the past year. And you have every good reason to believe, since you've taken all the data, that it is an independent sampling of the data set. So th this issue of dependency or independent is you know, sort of theoretically very important. But in the context of this class, it's not going to be important because almost always we're going to assume that our data sets are complete and hence are independently sampled. Any more follow-up questions on this? Hey, Adam, can I make one comment? Sure. Yeah, so regarding the question about the continuous and uh, uh, discrete variables, uh, in the next course where we are doing the probability course, uh, we'll treat lot, we'll discuss a lot more uh, the continuous variables and when you're dealing with continuous variables, you will have the density function where using the density function you can compute the expectation which is the mean and the second moment with, with the standard deviation. Whereas when we are dealing with finite discrete variables, you can use uh, the statistical formula which we have discussed in the last class to estimate mean and standard deviation. Just one comment. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a very good point that I should have um, uh, I should have made, uh, which is that statistics, in some sense, is, is a lot of applied probability, and that therefore. A lot of these things, you know, about distributions and independence are, are are sort of pushed under the rug in a statistics class. But when Niels teaches probability, you will get a much better understanding of them. And then someone commented, discrete uses sigma, continuous uses integration. And that's true, but I, I want I want to point out that the integral sign is uh, Sigma for some, that's right. And then the integral sign is um, just a Latin version of the letter sigma. Because an integral s starts, it, when you define an integral, it turns out that you just take finite sums and you just take increasingly larger numbers of, of finite sums. And the, in the limit, you get the integral. So in fact, the kind of irony of all this is that when you want to look at continuous variables and you do things like integration, they all come versus by um, taking the discrete case and creating this process called the limit, as you've seen in calculus, and taking the limiting case, and that's how you get that. Okay. Uh, one or two more points. I, I guess the only thing I want to state at this point is there is a function called scale, which will take a data set and pull out the mean and 
divide by the standard deviation, so it'll turn a data set into one with mean zero and standard deviation one. This is uh, very useful a lot of times. Uh, so uh, as I said, um, oh, and our norm creates um, normal distribution data sets. So if I take R norm 100, it's going to create 100 samples from a distribution of mean zero and standard deviation one. Now just to take a look, we do in fact see that the numbers, the, the median and the mean, and median is because the distribution is symmetric, that means that the normal distribution is just as likely to get a number below zero as a number above zero. You expect the median to be zero as well as the mean. And you can see this is approximately true. Um, now, if you just plot it, you get something that looks very bizarre. That's because it's just showing you that the data is random. If you look at a histogram, you're going to get something that looks more like what you expect. So notice that with 100 samples, this does not look at all like the bell curve, which is what we think of as the normal distribution. Um, so what does it look like? The famous name for the normal distribution is the bell curve. And the mean controls the centering and the standard deviation how widely the data is dispersed controls how pinched it is in the middle. So let me just give you an example. Uh, here I've plotted uh, a normal distribution. Now why did this work? The D norm instead of R norm, R norm stands for random normal, D norm stands for density. So it's going to tell you the probability of getting these values. So if you look, I took um, a set of values between minus three and two and calculated the, the, the uh, normal curve with just these finite number of points. Now it's not continuous, but notice that it would be very, very easy to draw a continuous line and it would just look like the normal distribution that you expect to see. So this is, the point is very large finite approximations are for all practical purposes the same as the infinite distribution. So D norm is what you do to plot. Uh, and we'll talk more about ggplot later, but ggplot is much better for graphics in general. Though ironically, for normal distributions, just simple plots like this, there's no reason to use ggplot. Okay, so as I was saying, D norm gives you a density. So I'm, here are three different normal distributions. I've taken the same data uh, points and I've taken a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, a second one with mean zero and standard deviation three, and a third one with still mean zero, but now standard deviation 0.3. And so we can see, and, and I've just given them different colors. So here's the regular one. Now notice the blue one has the data much closer in, and the red one has the data dispersed all over the place. Well, let's take a look. Red is Y2 is the one with the larger standard deviation. So notice that just tripling the standard deviation makes it look completely unlike the standard normal bell curve. You would need to look on a much bigger scale. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so the question is, could I please go over again the difference between R norm and D norm? Okay, R norm just gives you a random sampling. It doesn't order them. Okay, so if I take a hundred random points, I expect them to look random. This is what random data looks like. <laughs> is you know, I mean, there should be no connection between whether it's positive or negative, and the values within the range sort of bounded by the standard deviation. And that's what plotting R norm does. It's just giving me random data. On the other hand, if you looked at this data, you'll see much of the data is between one and minus one. And essentially almost all the data is between minus two and two. So if you say, what's the probability of my getting an answer between one and two? 
it's going to clearly, looking at this data, be much more than getting the probability of getting an answer between 0 and 1, right? So if you were to say, what's the probability, and look at these are going to give you the probabilities. This is saying that this is showing you the distribution of the data. This is showing you most of the data occurs right in the middle. And as you get further and further away from the data, you have smaller and smaller chance of getting it. So you can see these extreme observations have much more probabilities of occurring. So D-norm is, is the density function that um, Manish was talking about, uh, except, of course, this is a discrete version. So the D-norm allows you to plot your distribution, whereas R-norm just gives you the data points. So usually, um, you want to create random data, you'd use R-norm. Occasionally, uh, okay, so I'm also asked what is the x-axis, and the, and the answer is it's just because I didn't bother to do anything besides, say, plot D-norm, I didn't give it a y-axis of between minus 3 and 3. It just took the number of observations. But really, yeah. this would correspond to an, an, a, a value of 0. Yeah, exactly. Like, if we have given the x-axis, it would have been much, uh, it would have been a little bit easier to see that uh, the center is 0, and then to the extreme, we have minus 2, or minus 3 to plus 3 values. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll... Um, I just wanted to do this quickly, so but I will uh, give an example. I'll add when I publish these notes, I'll add an example where I've made the axis correct and explain how to do it. But um, the point is, I mean, I mean, the moral of this is that I really wanted you to take away was just the shape. Okay, uh, and finally, standard error. Let me um, preface this with a story, which is that when Bush was running, George W., the, the son, was running for president uh, the first time, the TV news, uh, I guess he was running against Gore, yeah, was always the headlines where the latest polls say that Bush is winning 51 to 49, but with a 2% margin of error, and so therefore we cannot say Bush is winning or not. And at one point, I turned to my friend and said, Bush has to win. And he said, why? The polls are all within the margin of error. I said, yes, if one poll comes in with the margin of error, that would be true. You don't really know. But they've now sampled, if you will, from the populations hundreds of times with these hundreds of polls, and they all say that Bush is going to win. At this point, <laughs> you don't have that same standard error. And so that's what standard error measures. Is if you it's it's an it, it's a way of estimating how much you expect your mean estimate to be off, and it's a function of the, the number of samples you said. So in this case, each poll was a sample. You're sampling sampling from the population of American voters, and each time you're sampling and getting an estimate. So if you take one estimate, you have the normal distribution error. Would say you know the error is plus or minus two percent. It means nothing. But what the media was failing to do was to understand that since they'd taken hundreds of polls, literally, and that they all showed, or almost all showed, Bush winning, the average true mean was not the, was still going to be the 51%, but the standard error kept going down. So that's the important point, the lesson to take away from standard error. And that is in that if you're doing repeated sampling, as you sample more, your ability to estimate how accurate you are is what's going up. So you may not change what your number is, but how sure you are of that number is what's increasing. Okay? And as I said here, the mathematical formulation would be that if you take these estimates and you average them, as you go to infinity, this is going to be converged to the true value, the true estimate. Now, I guess I didn't write it there. There's a funny sort of thing. You only know the limit as n goes to infinity. <laughs> it's a rule of thumb, though. 10 or 12 will usually work. 
And um, the reason why this works is this is what I call the CLT, the central limit theorem, which again will be discussed in way more detail in Neil's class. That says with mathematical certainty that as you estimate the mean and take these averages, the estimates are going to be the estimates are going to be approximately normally distributed. So if you take enough estimates of a distribution that isn't normally distributed or anything, you the, your estimates of the mean are in fact normally distributed. It's standard deviation on the x-axis. Um, is that with regard to um, this? I, I don't. I don't think that's right. Okay. Now, we've talked a lot about the normal distribution as the best case scenario. I, I want to bring up, oops, Chebyshev's in a quality. That's a typo. Um, you don't always know that your data is normally distributed. If you do, you have this wonderful fact that 68% of your data will be within one standard deviation of the mean and 95% will be within 1.96. That's why 1.96 is important. That is it. Uh, so I'm asked a question about uh, the size of the distribution. I uh, don't understand the question. If you could um, re-ask it with more details, I'll try and answer it. Okay, and let me just at this point stop before we get into Chebyshev's inequality and say, are there any more questions on uh, what we just talked about? Standard error, normal distribution. All right, let's let's before we go into Chebyshev, let's uh, go uh, let's go to the polls. Okay, so the first one is I have two data sets. One is one, three, five, seven, and the other is minus one, minus three, minus five, minus seven. What is their correlation? And the four choices is correlation one, correlation minus one, correlation zero, or if I take the dot product of the two vectors, which is what that is, minus 84. Okay, remember, correlation is um, ranges, it tells you how well your data is um, linearly connected. I'm going to close the polling in just uh, another few seconds. Okay, almost everyone got this right. 86% of you said 75% uh, go minus one, 25% go that. All right. Um, the correct answer is minus one because y is just the negative of x. So it's the same data but in the opposite direction. It's That's why it's not one because it's the same data but in the opposite direction. The correlation isn't zero. There, there's a strong linear connection between them. These numbers are the opposite of each other. Now, this final number, the dot product, is not correct because the dot product gives you something called the covariance, not the correlation. The correlation is scale covariance. And if you properly scaled this number, you would find the scale you wanted to use was 84, which would be the length of these vectors, and you would get that minus one is the answer. Okay. And one more on uh, this, and let's just do this quickly. If correlation is zero, there is no relationship between X and Y. Hey, Adam, uh, I think there are a couple of guys who have questions, so I'll just unmute them to so that they can ask their question quickly, if that is okay with you. Yeah, okay. So, um, I'm unmuting uh, Ratish. Ratish, you can go ahead and ask question. You're unmuted. Uh, suppose uh, if the data is not normal, so do we have to do the transformations and all make it normal? 
Okay, now I see your, um, some reason on this screen, I, I apologize, my regular computer is sick and uh, I'm using a laptop which somehow it's interacting funny with the screen. So the question is, if the data is not normal, can we transform it or do we transform it to make it normal? Um, the answer is no, we don't and, and you, you probably can't. Normality is an intrinsic property of the data. What you can do is scale the data so it looks like a normal distribution with um, mean uh, zero and standard deviation one, but we can't make it normal. If it was normal or looks normal, we can make much better estimates, you know, via standard errors and whatnot, as to how accurate our estimates of the mean of a data set might be. But we cannot transform non-normal data to make it normal. It, it, I mean, there's just there's no way to do it, and, and, and if you did figure out a way to do it, you change data points, say, well, you know, I have too much extreme data, I'm just going to call these outliers. What you're really doing is playing with the data and changing it. So knowing a data is normal or not normal is just part of what you know. Okay. I think so, we have one more question. I think I'll just unmute uh, Pushan as well. Thing. Okay. Last, yeah, Pushan, go ahead. Is a normal distribution a kind of empirical empirical formula? Um, so that that's a complicated question to ask. Uh, so you should know that the normal distribution was came from empirical data evidence. It was discovered by um, a mathematician named Gauss when he was looking at the errors in um, astronomical data. But when you're talking about the the, the continuous normal distribution, it's not an, an empirical formula. It, it's, it's, it, there's an absolute formula that gives you uh, the probability that in a normal distribution your data will lie within a certain range. And as I said, uh, you know, when you do graph the distribution function, it's a continuous function which has um, a very nice formula. So you do not, it's not empirical. It came from empirical evidence, but it is not empirical at all. all right. I don't know why these are not showing up. Maybe I'll try and keep that there. Okay, so this one most of you uh, got wrong. If the correlation is zero, then there is no relationship between X and Y. That's not true. There is no linear relationship. I, I just, um, I, I, I really want to keep emphasizing this. You know, if you find two data sets have a correlation of zero, that doesn't mean there's no relationship with them. It just means it's complicated. Remember the example of X and cosine X. Those two data sets are uncorrelated. There is no really linear relationship, but there's a very nice curvy relationship. Okay, uh, so let me just go back to Chebyshev for a second and then we'll do a little bit more. So normal distribution came from empirical, but it isn't empirical. But the nice thing about it is if your data is approximately normal, you have these very strong estimates for how much variation you, are, you have in the data. But even if you have non-normal data, there has to be such a result of some sort because you couldn't have all your data was too far away from the mean. It just doesn't make sense in some sense. And I'm, and I'm speaking very informally now. But there is a theorem that uh, calls you that, and it's called Chebyshev's inequality, or as I wrote, Chebyshev's in eulity. So I think most people call it inequality. So what the statement says is that not too much of the data can be too far of the mean. That's a very informal statement. But the important thing to understand is that 2.4 is measured in terms of standard deviation. So over here we have 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. So what Chebyshev says is regardless of your distribution, at most one over k squared of the data can lie more than k standard deviations away from the mean. So you can state that in terms of probability. And, and, and by the way, all these results I uh, have statements in, in terms of finite data sets and in terms of uh, continuous data sets. 
but you would state it as saying that the probability of a data lying more than k standard deviations from the mean is about most 1 over k squared. So that's what Chebyshev's theorem is. Just going back for a second, the probability that your that your your sample is within 68 percent of the mean, within one standard deviation of the mean, is 68 percent. Is your 68 percent probability for a normal distribution? Um, and so you're going to get a weaker one in general. So let's do an example. If k equals 2, 1 over k squared equals 1 fourth. So the conclusion is at least 75% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean, always. Now remember, for a normal distribution, you had a probability of, uh, nine, actually it's 96% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. So it's much weaker. And in fact, the normal distribution I mean, if you, if, you, if you don't allow yourself to create kooky finite distributions and insist on reasonable looking distributions, you can't do better than a normal distribution. So another example, if we take k equals 3 halves, k squared is 4 ninths, right, because it's 1 over. k squared is 9 fourths, so 1 over 9 fourths is 4 ninths. So at least 5 ninths of the data is within one standard de one and a half standard deviations of the mean. Now compare that with a normal distribution where 65% of the data or so is between within one standard deviation of the mean. So the conclusions are weaker, but the advantage is they always hold. Okay, so you don't tend to use Chebyshev's inequality a lot in real world situations, but it's important that you know it's there. There are going to be times when you're, you're not going to have a good information on your distribution and you're going to want to be able to say this and make some sort of estimates for your mean. So just to give an R example, remember we had the weather data set and I read it into my R session with read.csv. And remember, while CSV stands for co comma separated variable, in this case the data set is separated by the semicolon. And we see that the uh, mean is 15.74, and we calculate the standard deviation, which is the function SD, and it's 4.3. So, I mean, you know, this is reasonably large. It's centigrade, of course, but it's saying that uh, there's a reasonable amount of variation in the weather in a year, average temperature, which is how it should be. So we get the mean is 15.75 and two standard deviations is 8.6. So Chebyshev's theorem says if I know nothing about this data set, I still can be sure that at least 75% of the time the temperature is between 7.15 and 24.35. That's a great a priori result. Now, what's the reality? <laughs> I can actually calculate that it's 98%. Now let me just explain what I did. Remember we talked about the which function which gives you an index. So I said which weather average temperature is greater than um, uh, 7.15 and it's also less than 24.35. So this which is saying give me the indices of the weathers that are between which are greater than um, the mean minus two standard deviations and are also lower than the mean plus two standard deviations. That's an index, right? It's, it has a length, right? So the length of that will be how many elements are in there. And the length of whether that average temperature will be the average, will be how many observations. So this will be the percentage of the data set that is within two standard deviations. And we see it's over 98%, which is certainly bigger than 75%. But, uh, Okay, are there any questions with how I did that? Or are there any questions on Chebyshev? The moral of Chebyshev is that you can always make some sort of estimate based on standard deviation for uh, how accurate your mean estimate is. And notice what it says is as the standard deviation gets smaller, your estimates get better. All right, let's say, I think I had a couple of polls on this. Where are the polls? All 
All right, so I'm hoping that this one is going to be pretty easy. Using Chebyshev's inequality, always 95% of the data is within 1 or 90.96 standard deviations of the mean. Is this true or false? So we just discussed normal distributions, and we just discussed uh, Chebyshev's uh, inequality, which doesn't assume normal but gives you a weaker um, result. Okay, I'll give you another uh, 15 seconds. I think people are um, voting relatively quicker. Okay, so I'm asking, is, does Chebyshev's inequality say that 95% of the data is within 1.96 standard deviations of the mine? Okay. It's actually pretty close, 44% uh, true, 56% false, and the, the false have it. Only if the data is normally distributed, right? What we saw over here, it's actually on the screen, it's 75%. So Chebyshev's inequality will tell you that 75% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. To get that 95% result, you need to have a normal distribution. Okay, so th this is um, actually now summarizing some things we've been talking about. So we usually only have a sample of our full data set. The idea of statistics is to get numbers that describe the sample and use them to estimate the population. And the point of having a normal distribution, or if you don't, you being able to use Chebyshev's inequality, is to be able to make concrete the, that idea, and that idea is how accurate is our estimates. So using information about your distribution, you get information on worst case scenario of how bad our estimates could be. What's the worst case scenario? They could be better than that, but do that. So I want to talk about hypothesis testing and um, statistical testing. If you have two different data sets, for example, two different polls, uh, for example, the weather in two different cities, for example, the weather in the United States over two different years, over a number of years, you want to test if, if you're really seeing something different or is this just an artifact of the fact that you're randomly sampling. So the procedure is, is you draw up a null hypothesis, a hypothesis, which is called the null hypothesis. Typically, when you have two data sets and you're measuring their mean, the null hypothesis is simply that there is no difference. And then you determine the probability of using the different, of observing the difference you've seen, given that the null hypothesis is true. So you're asking, what's the probability that I'll get values that are this far apart, given the fact that I am sampling from the same distribution? Okay, that's a pretty big chunk to swallow, so I'm gonna stop for a second and allow time for people to ask questions. I'm opening my chat window so I can make sure I see it. Oh, and I see Pushan, someone else has added that uh, the Chebyshev's inequality is more conservative. Yeah, so we've, as that's true. The point is, is it's more conservative in the sense it makes a less strong conclusion. It's more conservative because you have less information. You know, just knowing that it's an arbitrary distribution, funny things can happen. So, statistical testing summary. You draw up a hypothesis, the null hypothesis, almost always that your two data sets are the same. And then you determine what's the probability of seeing those differences given that hypothesis is true. Are there any questions on what that is? Okay. This is... um. If you look in the text by kind, this is discussed in very, I think, very nicely and in very good detail. So I just want to summarize that. The null hypothesis is generally stating that data set if drawn from the same population should have the same properties. This is correct. If you draw a sample, the whole point of sampling is your mean is going to estimate the population mean. Remember the central limit theorem says that if you take a large enough sample size, you will in fact get as close as you want to the true mean. 
So the null hypothesis is, is somewhat different. If you take a large enough sample from a data set, you will, of course, get arbitrarily close to the mean. What the situation that statistical testing does is I've actually drawn two samples from different data sets, and the question is, do those data sets or are those data sets likely to have the same mean? So this is a very practical real-world question. I mean, this happens all the time. You want to know, does your data, you have, um, you give a before and after. You, 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 <laughs> you tell somebody, read a book and answer some questions. And then you tell people, read a book, let me give you a lecture, and then I'll answer some questions. And you want to see, does the, peep, does the group that actually had the video, was it helpful? Is the average score uh, different? So, you know, you're going to have the average score on a test of the people who just read the book and the average score on the test of the people who read the book and saw a video. And just knowing that the second is larger than the first doesn't guarantee that, in fact, the video was helpful. I mean, what if the video had nothing to do with the test? And you're just trying to test if watching a video makes people relaxed or not. So the idea of statistical testing is that the null hypothesis is typically that there is no difference because it's just easier to work with that, is you're trying to understand if there's a difference between the two populations. Do they have the same mean or not? Okay, just like if data sets are uncorrelated, that doesn't mean there's no relationship. A very, very important fact that anyone who writes about this always says, but somehow frequently doesn't seek in, is if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, that is if you say, according to my statistical testing, the two means are the same, that doesn't mean that the hypothesis is true. It just means that you can't reject it. You don't have evidence you could have been just extremely unlucky. And I, I don't want to go in, we'll talk more about this when we talk about linear models, but there are two ways that things can go wrong, and they're called type 1 errors and type 2 errors. But basically, you can falsely reject a correct hypothesis, or you can falsely accept a false hypothesis. So if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, i.e. you accept it, you could still be accepting it even though it's wrong. So you have to be careful with these sorts of things, and we'll talk more about this later. And finally, the book points out that sometimes scaling data for comparison is relevant. So if you have data sets and they have, you know, different means, but if, you know, due to a different scaling, you can scale the data. Um, and in the text, he talks a lot about z-tests versus t-tests. And t-tests are distributions that look like normal distributions, but with the idea that you definitely have a small, finite sample size. And unless the, the, the sample size is incredibly small, five or six or less, there's essentially rounding errors the difference between z-tests and t-tests. Now, t-tests and t-distributions, I'm not trying to denigrate their importance. I'm saying they're not important when you have small sample size. In fact, one of the reasons why T distributions uh, become important is because of their, in essence, because they are based on a sample being definitely finite, they illustrate a lot more fat tails phenomena. Okay, I just want to do an R example of how this all works. Um, so I'm creating a matrix called mean bin, and I just say matrix NA50. What does this mean? It means I'm going to create a matrix that has NA in all its bases and it has 50 rows. Why do I put NA instead of 0 or minus 1 or something? Because if something goes wrong, I will see there are NAs in my matrix and not numbers. Now, what am I doing? For I equals in 1 to 50, so for 50 times, I'm going to take a normal distribution 100 of a sample size 100 of mean 10 and standard deviation I. And then I'm going to actually see what the mean of that particular sample is. So I'm going to have 100 estimates of the mean of a normal distribution of mean 10 and, and standard deviation 3. Now, if I get the summary, this will tell me what my estimates are. So the mean value is 9.95, which is pretty close. But notice I got 
some means as high as 10.45, and some as one at least as low as 9.9. .9. So they, even though I've taken absolutely from a sampling from the same population, we see there's a reasonably big difference between um, what the values you're going to get. Okay, so just uh, for a fact, I repeat the same thing, but this the only difference is now the standard deviation instead of being three is 0.3. So now I'm saying that my estimates, my difference that my data varies from my mean is much less by a factor of 10. Now look what happens. Now not only is my mean almost exactly 10, but the errors have gone down by a factor of 10 roughly from 9.09 .09 to 9.9 .9, from 10.4 to 10.04 so you can see that so the two takeaways from this are one even if you know what your population uh, mean is when you sample you should not expect to get exact results and two your standard deviation in your answer it's going to be very, very important in determining how accurate things are. What is set.c? That's a great question. So you may ask, how can you create random numbers, which is what this is, with um, a computer, which is a deterministic object? Thank you for bringing this up. I completely forgot to mention that, and this is important. So computers always have a random seed generator. So what that means is if you tell it what, where to start, it will start generating quote-unquote random numbers from starting with something to do with that seed. So if I set my seed, that's telling it where to start. So what that means is every time I run this, if I started with set.seed17 on my computer, every time it's going to pick the same set of 100 random numbers, the 50 times will be exactly the same, and I will get exactly the same answers. If I didn't set seed, when I did it again, I would get similar but different answers because I would have a different set of random numbers that it's generating. So set seed is very important if you want to be able to reproduce your results exactly. When you set seed, everything that goes on from there is going to be the exact same. So in other words, and this is a sort of an irony of um, random numbers, once you set seed, your random numbers are fixed. It is always going to give you the exact same sequence of random numbers. Thank you for asking that very good question. All right. Uh, I have um, another example. Perhaps uh, I will just leave that for you to. Um, can we have, oh, can the seed be anything besides 17? The seed can be anything. Uh, 17 is uh, due to my upbringing and a, a joke from when I was a kid is my favorite random number. You can set seed to anything you want. So let, let's just take a look. Um, uh, control L. I just want to get a blank screen. Okay, so set dot seed one one one. I'm just picking um not too big numbers. R norm ten. Now if I set seed one one one, I should get exactly the same numbers. Huh. Yeah. Now if I hit R norm again without hitting set that seed, I should get different 10 random numbers. See, because it's this gave me the first 10 random numbers of set with that set dot seed, and then it gave me the next 10. So you can set that seed anything you want. I mean, see, uh, that's too big. So there is some limit to set seed. So suppose I want to know how big set seed could be. It's just question mark set dot seed will show me then over here in random number generation. And somewhere over here it'll tell me what the largest random number I could have is. So just a point on that.
All right, I want to just, um, so this is a good philosophical question. Doesn't it invalidate the test that the numbers are not truly random? Or in this case, is it just for illustration purposes? Um, the answer to that is, how could we ever generate numbers that were truly random by a deterministic process? So you could, and there are answers to that. You could say, look, I'm going to throw darts. And um, I'm going to throw a dart a million times at a bunch of numbers. And those is how the numbers I'm going to take. But in practice, where you have need to have large number of um, random samples, this wouldn't work. There aren't enough people willing to throw darts at numbers. So what we're really generating are not random numbers, but something called pseudo-random numbers. And what this means is that these are numbers that in a very technical sense are somewhere between very hard and impossible to distinguish from numbers that are truly randomly generated. So while it's true the numbers are not actually truly random, they act as if they are random numbers. You saw that, for example, when I did the, the distribution of the, the random of the um of the random numbers, and it did come out to look approximately normal. Now, if I told you, if you look closely enough, in fact, like, you know, from the real normal curve, you were off by 0.002, you say, okay, but that doesn't really change things much. So, for all practical purposes, you should think of random numbers as being random that are created by these things. And if you want to make sure you get the same answer every time, use set seed, set dot seed. Okay. Can we prove law of large numbers by generating computer-generated random numbers? So the question is, can we prove the law of large numbers by generating computer-generated random numbers? And the answer is no. The law of large numbers, or the central limit theorem, are mathematical theorems that have logical proofs. What you can do is find strong evidence for the law of large numbers by drawing, generating random samples, random numbers. So you can use um, computer statistics to find evidence. And, and that gets back to what I was saying about hypothesis testing. With hypothesis testing, you can never conclude that your hypothesis is correct or incorrect. You can just find good evidence one way or the other. You can be reasonably assured. When I was um, a trader, there was a, a trader who used to like to say good enough for government work, by which he meant that it wasn't exactly correct, but it was pretty close. And that's what random number generation does, is it's good enough for government work. It'll give you answers that are almost undoubtedly correct, but you do not have the moral certainty that a mathematical proof will have. Are there any other questions? All right, so I just want to talk a little bit about ggplot for graphing. Uh, and ggplot is a different package. And it's developed by Hadley Wickham. And it's discussed extensively in R for Data Science. Though I think you need to give credit to Leland Wilkinson, who came up with the first ggplot. And you'll notice that um, ggplot is, in fact, So if I wanted to load it, I'd say library, library gg, and it's ggplot2, not ggplot, but it's commonly called ggplot. It's actually already loaded. Um, but it, it has a number of advantages. Uh, gg stands for the grammar of graphics, and it does create a standard syntax. It also makes it much um, easier to do overlays. And the other thing that's nice about ggplot is it allows you to do a lot of very fancy things um, without much work, things that are much, much harder to do with standard R graphics. So to create a plot, you have to give it the data set. You have to tell it which plot or plots you want it to do, and you have to tell it which two variables you're going to graph. So um, all the examples here come from one of two sources, the book R for Data Science, or this the analytical minds block spot, which is where the weather data set comes from. So library ggplot2. So I call the ggplot function, and 
I'm just telling it the data is something called MPG, whatever that is. It's a data set. More in a second on that. And then I tell it geom point. So that's um, ggplot language for a scatter plot, x versus y. So you always have to tell it what its um, x and y is. I personally find this verbose, but the grammar people like it. So the mapping which is what telling what X and Y is, you, you don't just say X is this, Y is that, but you say the aesthetics is X equals display, Y equals highway. Displacement, not display. Hey, and we get this chart. So you say that's a nice scatter plot chart. What is it a scatter plot chart of? Good question. Um, And when I do summary MPG, we see we have a class manufacturer. It's character, but it's going to be car manufacturer's model. This is displacement, how big the engine is, the years was built, the number of cylinders. Now, notice cylinders, while technically numeric, because it's telling you it runs from four to six, we know cylinders always come in even numbers. So there's four, six, and eight. So you can really consider this as a factor. Uh, and there's a bunch of variables. So it's data about our... Uh, it's a data set about cars. Now, one of the nice things about ggplot is if you want to add more uh, plots to your mapping, it's simple. The important thing is you just add a plus, and the plus has to be on the line where it started out with. So if you want to draw lines through data, it's geom underscore smooth. And now I just use the same aesthetics, and look what it did. It drew its best estimate for the straight line, not the straight line, for the line through the data. Now, this is something that is very hard to do in, in straightforward R plotting. So, if for no other reason than to do this, it would really be worthwhile to learn ggplot. And you see what it did, because I didn't give it a new data set, it just drew them together. Okay, the other thing is, is you can tell it if you have a, a factor, you can make it distinguish how things look by factor. So in this one, I've redone the plot, except on the points, I have the same thing, but I've added color equals class. Class was one of the variables. It was a, it was a uh, factor variable, and you can see the class is one of these things. Two-seater, compact, mid-size, minivan, pickup, subcompact, SUV. And by telling it color equal class, you tell ggplot, for each one of these different values of the variable, color the scatter plot with a different color. And you can see. You can just see. So, for example, you know, you have these uh, pink things, those are SUVs. These green things, these are mid-size. So the best miles are these two things, these two purple dots up here. Not unsurprisingly, those correspond to subcompact cars. So if you're looking to analyze your data set, this is really a very, very nice thing. And this would be incredibly complicated to program with the ordinary plot function. But here it is. All I did was I took my previous um, piece of code and I added one line, color equals class, and I get that. Okay. I'm going to ask, are there any questions at this point? Uh, let's see. I lost my chat. Here it is at the top. Okay. Um, so the question I'm asked is ggplot to draw scatter plots. ggplot is to do anything. Uh, if you look at reading the text, there's, I think, about 20 different geoms, which are 20 different plots. Uh, you can use it to do scatter plots. As you can see, you can do it to draw lines. You can also use it for bar charts. Let me see. I'm trying to... Just want to get a little ahead of myself, yeah. So here, just to, I'll go back, but geom underscore bar gives you bar charts. 
Okay. So I just want to give another example of how ggplot works. And, and you'll have to, I mean, ggplot is one of these things. It's an incredibly powerful and fun tool to use. But there is, I mean, I don't remember all the things that you can do with it. What I do is I say, I want to do this, and I'll do something like say, oh, I know where to look that up, or I do know how to do that. I mean, I obviously know the few simple ones, geom.bar, geom line, and uh, geom underscore point. But um, once you know that ggplot can do something, finding out how to actually what's the syntax isn't hard. So here is just um, another scatter plot with the weather data, just to give another example. So notice what I did was I said ggplot. In this case, I could do this. I gave it the data, and I gave it the aesthetics. And the aesthetics are I want the x-axis to be the day of the year and the y to be the average temperature. And then I just said I'm going to do a point, and the only information I gave it is I want it to be blue points and I get this mess. So if I wanted to get some sort of idea of where sort of the average is, I add geom underscore smooth. So smooth will take a data point set and find the best line. So here we see the best line and it isn't very good. And this suggests maybe that a histogram might be useful and so I give it the same data of weather, and now I just tell it geom bar, and geom bar means histogram, and I want to get the average temperature. So this gives me counts of the different temperatures. All right. Now, I want to do a workflow and talk is it possible to draw ggplot across attribute from two different data frames? No, you have to give it all the data. But if you had you want if you had something where you wanted to um, use two different data frames, you could combine them. You could use CBind to create a data frame. Now remember, this is only going to work. The x number, the x y's have to be the same. So if the data sets had the same number of rows, you could use CBind to create a new data set which had all your data, and then you could now you could be combining, uh, you would be plotting two uh, columns of what was one data frame. So the exact answer to your question is no, as stated, but shortly, yes, of course, you can do that, assuming you know they have the same number of data points. You just put them into the one data set. Um, is it similar to curve fitting? So geom underscore smooth is curve fitting. Uh, you might notice using method equals LERS, L-O-E-S-S, -S, this is um, a, one of the standard methods for curve fitting. Uh, I am would bet money that you could use splines if you preferred, but I, and if, you, if ggplot doesn't support using splines, splines is, a, if you don't know what a spline is, don't worry. Uh, I guarantee you there's an extension that does uh, explain how to use splines. There's a lot of extensions for ggplot. So this is a very uninteresting graph of the weather. So let's just go through, I want to copy this. So now I'm going to open a new R script. I'm just going to paste all that data there. Now remember, with a script, this gives you a way to just save a bunch of commands and run them. So if I do that, and I can either hit, I can either hit the run, that gave me my basic thing, or I could actually hit Control and Enter. So as long as the, the cursor is anywhere on the line, I'm good. Uh, I can actually do this, it'll work just as well. So now I say, well, I, I, I want to understand these things, you know, by the weather, by the months, and months is one of the variables. So I hit run, and it says unexpected input, color equals month. So it doesn't understand that. What went wrong? Um, let me try it again. 
Maybe I just didn't do something right. Nope, attribute month is not found. See, the first time I said, well, maybe it's because it doesn't like the parentheses. And hint, it doesn't want uh, the, the, the uh, quotation marks. See here, you know that. But it wasn't that. The problem is the aesthetic is where you put the color equals month. So once I do that, now look what happens. When I run, it runs. But color equal month doesn't seem to do anything. In fact, if you look carefully enough, you would find it dead. What you really want is to use not color equals month, but something called fill. And uh, let me run this. And again, I'm getting something weird. And if I look over here, I see what the issue is. Whether month is an integer. It's the numbers 1 through 12. And for this aesthetic equals fill, fill equals month to work, it's looking for a factor. So the final thing I do is I say my data is the weather. I want a bar chart, gm.bar, my mapping. My aesthetics is x equals average temperature. So I want the fill to be the month but as a factor because that's what ggplot understands for this. It's looking for a factor. Now look what happens when I run it as soon as I move this out of the way. Now you can see something really pretty. Here now it's showing you by the month what the, the, the distributions are. So now you can get an idea well gosh green and blue is where you're getting the most really high temperatures um, well, green and blue, month six and seven. Month eight is another one very high. So you can see this fill um, allows you to sort of by the category or by the factor to keep track of that. Now, there's some very nice examples of this in the book, but I didn't want to just copy the book. Are there any uh, more questions? Okay, so I, I assigned the reading, you know, so now hopefully it makes a little more sense. Uh, I will also post in addition to uh, these two uh, documents, another one called Wine, where I give an example, another example of uh, testing, another example of statistical testing. In this case, it's a wine data set, and we're going to ask the question of, is wine quality impacted by how much alcohol is in the wine? And I will post that. And if there's interest, which I will judge by people emailing me and saying, please go over this. If there's interest, I'll quickly review it next week. All right. Any more questions? I'm going to unmute people uh, if I can remember how. Uh, one comment here. Uh for assignment zero, we are going to give like two additional days, so you have till Tuesday to submit that assignment because some of the people were having problem installing R Studio. That was the first assignment. Uh -huh. uh, so please, I again emphasize that the only way you can learn, uh, you can better learn this subject is by doing assignments and the reading assignments, which was given by Adam. And make sure that after lecture, you go through whatever is the assignment posted. Uh, on the LMS, uh, Adam is doing a lot of hard work to come up with the appropriate exercises and reading assignments. So make sure you do all of them. Uh, for assignment zero, we don't have, you do not have a lot to do. Even if you spend three, four hours, you should be able to catch up if you haven't done it so far. So I request you to go through the LMS and try finishing that assignment. Uh, I'll, I'll just add to what Manisha said and, and just saying if you fire up your RStudio session, um, you will and just type in on your own R Studio session the the commands that I've done, and you can tell what what's R code because it's always in this in this box on uh, the .rmd files, okay, and um, you 
you can only see it on, on the HTML documents because it shows up as the, a great area. So code, code, not code, code. If you just do this yourself, you'll just get to um, do it. Um, and so I see there's a discussion going in, going on about um, how to submit and whatnot. Now, leave that to Manish and um, Stephen. Uh, to uh, do that too. Okay, so this is all I have to say. I'm going to leave it open for uh, um, well, Manisha is saying he'd prefer to discuss this offline outside the lecture. So in that case, I'm going to wish you all a good rest of your day or a good evening depending on your location. And um, that's it if there's no more questions. I am getting some thanks. Uh, you're welcome. I know what the problem is. I'm going to stop recording now. Uh,